Stephen Wade, welcome to TwoFingerBanjo.com. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. It's Two Finger is so great that you're um, encompassing that style. When I first started playing uh, and first meeting older generation traditional musicians, um, I guess the oldest of whom was born in the late 1880s, by far uh, the most a prevalent style I encountered were varieties, varieties of two finger style, I, far more than frailing. Uh, and, and it's just, it was, you know, North Carolina and Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, uh, all of Virginia, all over the place. It, it, this, and I think, you know, I was talking with our friend Jack Buthin yesterday about this, and he says, well, the style offers a lot of, you know, variety and options, and it certainly does. And, uh, for accompanying ballads and for uh, instrumentals. And I think also these musicians who were born then in the late 19th century and early 20th, they, they had manufactured banjos finally, and they could go up the neck and they could explore the music in new ways. And ragtime, of course, had, had taken its, uh, it was influencing people with, uh, and rural ragtime emerges where you could do courting up here and part of the virtuosity that the young players are trying to explore and express uh, allowed what would ha occurred through both the medium of the two finger and as well as uh, three finger. And then it'd been around since uh, the time of the Civil War, certainly because the old banjo primers are showing us what they called guitar style as opposed to banjo style, which was the frailing. And if you look at the physical design of the instrument, the uh, gourd banjos they're, they're really set up for frailing that's the the, the the distance between the neck and the where the it joins that that you could tell that's the original an original style for the banjo but certainly the what as it changes and it modifies the two finger is there and and then there's also precedents in west africa finger picking styles certainly so it's 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 all there but anyway i just wanted to make the point that i was constantly encountering two finger styles amongst the older generation players that I, I, I met. And I, I made a tiny list uh, of, of, of some of them. And uh, uh, Uncle John Patterson, and then, uh, well, Doc Watson, uh, Bard Ray, Will Keys, Olabel Reed, Samantha Bumgarner, I didn't meet her, but she did some of that uh, two figure. Clyde Davenport, the fiddler, he played it. Uh, Virgil Anderson, Etta Baker, uh, Wade Maynor, who was just wonderful, got to play at one of his birthday parties, and he had a whole lot of them. He was the oldest old-time musician. Uh, Morgan Sexton, Lee Sexton did several styles, but Two Finger was certainly part of it. Uh, that tape that you and I both love from Corbin, Kentucky, of Raymond Perry and John Walker. Raymond is doing some of that. And um, uh, China Poplin from Sumter, South Carolina, he was terrific. There was a Folkways record that was uh, out. And there's another record, too, uh, that... Jack Toddle was part of that's a very good, uh, he's very good, uh, China Poplin. Uh, Ross Brown from North Georgia, from Hiawassee. Uh, Lawrence Eller, who I, I knew both of them and visited them. And uh, 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 Art Rosenbaum turned me on to them. Lan Norris, who was uh, recording in the 20s, he taught Chesley Chancy, and I, I visited Chesley. And, and, and Lan Norris, his um, Charm and Betsy, you may have heard on old recordings, among other things. Uh, Hobart Smith's mother, Sarah Lavinia Smith, was a two-finger banjo player. The the painter Howard Fenster, I knew him, and he he played in a two-finger style too. So, and then there's all these other players too, uh, like Pete Steele, uh, B. F., the people I'd like to, if there's time today, Bascom Lunsford, Frank Prophet, Doc Hopkins. Uh, J. Uh, I'm gonna do something of J. P. Nestor. He wasn't. Well, I'll, I'll explain that, but he's part of this story. Dick Burnett. Uh, Roscoe Holcomb, uh, D. Hicks, uh, uh, Hobart, uh, Omer Forrester, uh, uh, Kirk McGee did a two finger style. Uh, Gus, uh, I'm going to finger pick if there's time. A Gus Cannon song. He he did both picking and frailing. Um, Lewis Harrison, uh, 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 and then um, uh, and then I want if there's time I'll do something from W. A. Hinton who who frailed, but you could turn it into a two-finger thing. But I, I, I have let you get a word in edgewise. I'm sorry. I, 
uh, but I, I've just been thinking about these things, and I, I thought a way to start was, so in 1964, Doc Watson um, and his son Merle were accompanying uh, Doc's father-in-law, Gaither Carlton. So if there's this new music that's coming through that the two-finger banjo players are adapting to the banjo and incorporating of uh, songs of hearth and home and, and uh, the raggy, ragtimey kinds of things that follow that, uh, uh, from the sentimental songs of an earlier time. Uh, there's still the old old modal songs that are part of the, that were incorporated into two finger style. Okay, here we go. This is give a fiddler a dram, and watch what happens here. This is a two finger style that er, that's just so compelling. This could go on all day. That's wonderful. So that's the way to do it. You know, I know that we can't see Gaither and we can't see Doc in person or Merle anymore, but, but uh, we can learn from records from their example. That's beautiful, Stephen. Well, I love that you started with that list because one of the things I experienced in teaching two-finger banjo at the Old Town School of Folk Music, where you have spent so much time and I spent a number of years, is I would have beginning students for whom no particular banjo style seemed more prevalent than another. So they would just, they liked the sound of the banjo and that's where they started. And so we could talk about claw hammer and finger picking styles, both bluegrass and old time equally. But within the old time world that I grew up in since I was born in 1984, I feel like at, at festivals, fiddlers conventions, and just even picking parties in people's homes, there has been this implication that claw hammer is just like way more important or, or just way more pervasive or way more useful. or and, and it's not reflective of how musicians have played this instrument. And and your knowledge of, of musicians you, you've met and, and listened to as well just immediately goes in the face of this idea that claw hammer is 90 percent of of you know vernacular string band music and two fingers this little slice instead it's it's as varied and diverse and prevalent through through the years as as frailing styles have been yes and and you couple that with the individuality of these different uh, very talented musicians and then it becomes so many different ways to hit it for me my introduction two finger banjo uh, came through both fretless banjo and fretted banjo. And a pr the, the way I, I guess I first learned about it was through Frank Prophet. And he had come to the Old Town School in the spring of 1962. And he stayed with my teacher, Fleming Brown, during that time. And they did a workshop. And there's the photographs, uh, there's various photographs just of, of that session. I have one of them. Uh, in that, in the album notes to Across the Ameriki, but uh, uh, Peter Feldman has taken pictures. He was there. Uh, he just sent me a couple from a couple days ago. There's, uh, you'll see pictures online that they from that workshop that they did at the Old Town School, and uh, during that time, uh, uh, Frank Prophet stayed with Fleming Brown, and then he gave him this banjo which he had made and. He actually signed his name at the top here, 
And uh, may I show one more recorded example? Okay. Definitely. Okay. I didn't know we were going to get Stephen Wade, the DJ. This is such a treat. Oh, cut it out. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> hard for me to hold this uh, banjo and play it together but um, anyway you get the idea uh, that you can play along to these records just get in tune with it could could you give us a little bit more just you without the record yeah this is an actual possum skin head you can you can, you can still see the hairs on the inside, too. Oh, when Frank Proppett Jr. came and visited me here, he saw this band. I showed him his dad's banjo, and he wept. He had, a, had another banjo, uh, I do too, made by Clifford Glenn, a neighbor, but this one his dad really made. There were several makers in that community. banjos do you own oh just these couple i'm not a collector i uh i really i i fleming sold me this banjo in 1977 for 200 dollars, and nice. and i knew it was a it was worth every penny of it and more and and um and it just matters that it was frank's banjo yeah yeah tell if us look... uh, go ahead sorry no, if you look in the booklet cover for the first Frank Prophet record on Folk Legacy, um, there's a, in the booklet, there's a picture of Frank and standing next to him, that's Fleming Brown, and this band shows in between them. Yeah. Members of um, my Facebook club for Two Finger Banjo had the chance to ask you a question virtually, and yeah. one of them was wondering about... Um, I'd love for you to talk more about Fleming, but one of them was asking about Doc Hopkins as well. Um, it would be well, it would Doc, be nice to hear I mean, a little bit more about both of them. Well, I certainly want to talk about, be glad to talk about Doc. I was going to play a, a couple songs I'd learned from Doc um, and then someone that he learned from. Doc was Fleming. Uh, in 1948, Pete Seeger came to Chicago for the Henry Wallace Progressive Party uh, political campaign. Uh, Fleming had purchased a, a banjo by then at a pawn shop, but he didn't know how to tune it and he knew he wanted to play it. He had heard a recording 
of Hobart Smith and his sister on an album called Texas Gladden Sings Blue Ridge Ballads. I can I could show you the album. Uh, here it is. Uh, it was uh, th this record right here. And on this record, Hobart and his sister uh, play together on a number of the songs, as well as they each do solos. And one of the songs they did together, Texas sings poor Ellen Smith, and Hobart's playing all hell out of the banjo on that. And that was the song, that performance that made Fleming say the socks rolled you know, and you know, made him want to play the banjo, was that performance from that record. So he asked Pete Seeger, uh, if he knew anyone who would teach banjo. And Pete said, well, there's Doc Hopkins over at WLS. He was on National Barn Dance. He, Doc had come up to Chicago in 1930 to sing on the air. And uh, he had followed uh, Bradley Kincaid, also from that part of that Kentucky, where they were from. And uh, Doc was originally from Harlan County. Then he moved to Rockcastle County and went to school there. And um, and one of his classmates, older classmate, was John Lair, who was sort of the ma manager of talent at, at WLS. And so, and they were also schoolmates with Carl and Hardy. Uh, the song Kentucky that Carl Davis wrote, um, Here to Get My Baby Out of Jail, those songs. Well, they were also schoolmates. They're same one-room school. Anyway, um, so Doc comes up to Chicago to sing a national barn dance, and he's there for uh, uh for 20 years on the air. And uh, so Doc Fleming called Doc and uh, at the station, Doc said, well, he wanted to teach her. And Doc said, well, I, I, I can't teach you, but I can show you, which is a, just a profound idea right there of the difference between formal learning and informal learning. And that's what happened three times a week at, before Doc's morning show. He did a show called the Smile A While Show in the morning. And he would, Doc and Fleming would get together and Doc would show him pieces on the banjo. So to thank Pete Seeger, Fleming, who was a commercial artist, uh, drew the pictures for Pete's banjo book. Wow. Uh, at that time, Pete had just a 30 page mimeograph uh, text with a staple in the left hand corner. And then Fleming, let me put this down for a second. Fleming, uh, did these drawings along with one other person. Here is the actual first edition that he appeared in. Here it is. And you can see Fleming's name, Fleming wrote his name on the cover. So here, here is the, this is the second edition of the book. So the first book is mimeographed. And then it, there's Fleming's name right there. And then if you look in here, right at the beginning, It's printed by the author in 1954. So that's when this starts, this, this edition. And then comes this edition, which was the most famous one. Yeah, that's the one I have. And that's how I heard of Fleming. It says special acknowledgement and thanks go to artist and banjo picker of Chicago, Fleming Brown. And I, did, I didn't know who that was, but there he was in Pete Seeger's book. So I walked over to the Old Town School, which was in the neighborhood where I live, grew up, and but hadn't gone to before. And uh, I asked the lady behind the desk, Evelyn Brightman was her name, if she knew of someone named Fleming Brown. She said, yeah, he's teaching here tomorrow night. And I said, is he good? And she goes, Fleming. And then, and then I asked an idiotic question. I said, well, how many banjos does he have? And she said, 15. I said, sign me up. I figured he was pretty serious if he had 15 banjos. Well, there's a reason I asked you how many you have. Well, I've heard that story once before. I'm sorry. Well, old stories never die. Uh, it's a so, good one. Tell, um, the, tell the so, story, though, about real quick, if you don't mind, when Fleming was meeting Doc at the radio station and there was we were talking before we recorded about questions of time. There, there was a thing about what time to show up at the record at the radio station. Oh, oh right. Yes, yes. There was that initial confusion. Uh, Doc said, yeah, uh, come around five and Fl Fleming said, no, I, I get off work at 5, make it 5.30. And Doc said, no, 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 five, 5 in the morning. That's when I do my wake-up show. <laughs> That's how it happened. Yeah, co they had coffee and sweet rolls in the morning there. Uh, thank you for remembering that. So Doc Hopkins grew up playing. He started when he was very little um, 
in his family, uh, six or eight years old, he's playing, and uh, both banjo and uh, guitar. And uh, w one of the songs that uh, we used, I, when, when I came around and met Fleming, I, I also was fortunate enough to meet Doc through, uh, Doc was playing at a club in Chicago on Wrightwood, and my oldest friend, Freddie saw him and he and he knew who he was because I had talked about their Fleming had a teacher named Doc Hopkins and and then and the two met and then introduced uh, a Doc to me and so when I as a teenager I started playing as Doc's accompanist and I played with Doc until his death uh, he actually outlived Fleming uh, Doc died in 1988 uh, Fleming died 1984 uh, and uh, so. Uh, I love Doc. He was like a grandfather to me. And 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 Fleming, in a very, the last night that the three of us were ever together, actually made that point himself. He said, "We are a family. A family is not necessarily just blood." And I'll never forget that. I anyway, the a song that Doc did. Got to crawl in Sourwood Mountain, hot hold up the long day. So many bird girls I can't count them, hot hold up the long day. Chickens crawl in Sourwood Mountain, hot hold the long day. So many bird girls I can't count them, hot hold the long day. Ducks in the mill pond, geese in the ocean, hot hold up the lump day. Dells with a woman on a lake in an ocean, hot hold up the lump day. Oh, you get to crow on Sourwood Mountain, hot hold the lump day. Big dog a bark and a little one about you had a hold up the long day. Big girl court little one a marry you had a hold the long day. Chickens grow on Sourwood Mountain had a hold the long day. So many pretty girls I can't count them had a hold the long day. Bravo. That's beautiful, Stephen. Oh, thank you. When so, you um, when you accompanied no, Doc, just it, it occurred to me, were you on guitar or what instrument did you play when you performed with him? Oh, he played the guitar and I played the banjo. Um, oh, okay. Always. He he uh, uh, he had by then his he found his fingers had become tender. So he played a, a nylon string guitar. OK. And uh, but he played his old parts and um, uh, and preferred that I play the banjo for him. Now he played multiple styles. He did the down picking, but he did three finger and, and sometimes songs would be two finger. Uh, one of the person, now when he was a little boy, he would go to the county fair in Broadhead. And also there were court days when the circuit court would meet every month. And, and uh, one of the persons from Kentucky who would come there and travel there um, and uh, sell his songbook was, uh, was Dick Burnett. Really? And, uh, 
Yeah. So Dick Burnett, this is before. So this is, remember, this is, so we're talking 1910 now. So Burnett doesn't record until the 20s. So he's selling his songbook. Actually, Matt, hold on. Uh, uh, Um, he had a shop, a shop printed songbook. And so Dick Burnett is known to all of us because he's the source of the song uh, Man of Constant Sorrow. He never recorded it, but his neighbor and friend uh, did, uh, Emery Arthur. And then the Stanley Brothers learned it from Emery Arthur's recording. And then that becomes a huge, as you know, hit song. So here is actually the, the songbook that Dick Burnett sold. No way. Yeah, it really is the songbook. And, and it says the blind man in Monticello. Let me, I don't want this to tear apart, but here. I have to be really careful. Okay. Can you see that all farewell song? Can you read the words at all? A little bit, yeah. If you put, if you pull okay. in a little bit more, we'll get it. There it is. I am a man of constant sorrow. I've seen trouble on my days. Yeah, there it is, the original. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. So uh, this is what he sold, and. I'd rather have that than a bunch of bantos, really. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so one of the songs that Dick Burnett did record and that became kind of famous via the Harry Smith anthology published in 1952 was the song Willie Moore, which he recorded in 1927 for Columbia. The same melody I found has been used in other Kentucky songs of similar ballad uh, content, but the different songs. And uh, Grandpa Jones, for instance, who learned it from uh, Bradley Kincaid, who learned it from his mother, uh, did The Brown Girl, uh, which is a, a child ballad, to the same tune as what uh, Dick Burnett played to Willie Moore. age 21 he courted tap so fair all oh, her eyes were as bright as the diamonds in the night and wave black was her hair he courted her both night and day oh, Mary my dad agreed for when he came to bid her parents consent, they said it could never be. herself and Willie Moore's arms soft times had taught before but little did he think when they parted that night sweet Ellen he would see no more it was about the death of May the time I remember well that very same night where her body disappeared in a way no tongue could tell. Sweet Ellen was loved both far and near, had friends most all around. In a little brook before the cottage door, the body of sweet Ellen was found. 
she was taken by her weeping friends, carried to parents' room. There she was dressed in a shroud of snowy white, laid in a lonely tomb. One moans and the other weeps And in a little mound before the cottage door A body of sweet Ellen do sleep The song was composed in the cloudy west By a man you may never have seen I'll tell you his name but it is not in full. His initials are J R G. Goosebumps! Wow. <laughs> and that banjo, oh my gosh, has such a beautiful snarl to it. I love it. Oh. It's just tell us about that instrument in particular. Well. I got this banjo, January 1st, 1977, started with a twang, because that's the day I got this banjo. Uh, Fred Holstein, the folk singer in Chicago, lent me the money for it. I paid him back, uh, $550, and it's a, it's a number nine tubophone banjo uh, from the early 1920s, and um, a tool and die maker from Crystal Lake, Illinois, named Tim Riggs, uh, put it together, put, uh, fashioned the neck on an old pot and Fleming had one too that he the second one that Tim did this was the first one that he did and I've taken this banjo all across the seas and everywhere it's with me for a long time now this is when I opened banjo dancing my one man show this is what I was playing and so I st still play it I, I have to get you know um, uh, fret work done and stuff it wears out and but it, it still works and I'm glad glad you like it I have two questions about this banjo. So you opened your legendary show, banjo dancing on that banjo. Is that did you play that banjo for President Carter in the White House? Well, I kind of did. What happened is is that the day that okay, so I'm playing in Chicago, and then uh, this is Labor Day weekend, 1979, and so I had to. So the performance of the White House was on Monday, so I flew Sunday night after my last show to Washington DC from Chicago. I had this banjo overhead in the, you know, in the compartment. And then I had another banjo in, in, in a Mark Leaf case, a very big um, uh, fiberglass case that this maker uh, named Mark Leaf was producing at the time. And that was sort of, um, Earl Scruggs had one, Steve Goodman had them. They were, that's what everybody was using back then who was traveling a lot, uh, uh, Tom Pax had one. So, um, uh, I, I, I got to the, I didn't, that night I got to the hotel and I, I didn't really, I didn't open up the two banjos, I just went to sleep and stuff. And the next morning the Secret Service picked me up for the first rehearsal and they took me in the side entrance there and I, there's a stage, there's a band shell on the south lawn of the White House because they were expecting a couple thousand people, you know, and uh, labor leaders and their families. Um, and the whole labor movement ev um, was there. Uh, uh, everybody except George Meany, who couldn't come. But I mean, the, when Wim Singer, I mean, Secretary of Labor, there's all sorts of people were there. And uh, so I opened up the banjo case to re begin the rehearsal. And um, and this banjo head had cracked overnight from the moisture and the coldness between Chicago's hot air and the cold. F it was freezing on that airplane. I remember that. I was really cold in that airplane. So it had cracked. And so this is like the most important day of my life. I started laughing hysterically, I guess, because I remember the social secretary of the White House was looking at me like, what is wrong with this guy? And uh, I said, my banjo head is broken. And, uh, and so 
she sent somebody from the Marine Band over because the Marine Band plays a lot of drums. And the idea was, I said, well, it's 10 and 15, 16 inch head. Do you have, I knew it wouldn't have one. So I said, go look. Of course, you don't have any. So I played my other band show for, for the performance. This was, if, if you look at some of the still pictures that the White House photographer took, this banjo is sitting in the background there. But no, I didn't play it at the White House. But I had planned to play it. I had to play my other banjo, which thank goodness I brought with me because it was Labor Day. I, I mean, I couldn't go to a music store and buy a 10, 15, 16 inch head. And, uh, and they weren't exactly everywhere anyway. Uh, so you have to go to a specialty place. Uh, so then given the, the topic of this interview, did you play two finger banjo on the South Lawn of the White House? I don't know that I did. I I played I th I did do some two finger picking in the midst of doing uh oh yeah, the answer is yes, I did, but it was just within the fabric of accompanying a particular story because it was Labor Day. Uh one of the things that the uh social the the, the White House Rosalind Carter read a review of me in Time magazine that was life changing review and so she sent her staff, three people, to see me in Chicago to see if it was true. They told me that one of the things they would like me to do, because the Time article called attention to it, was when I did this, I had memorized the second chapter of Tom Sawyer when he whitewashes the fence, perhaps the most famous passage in all of Twain. And, and, uh, but it was about late, work is whatever a body is obliged to do and plays whatever a body is not obliged to do. And he transforms the task of whitewashing fence into a great game of play. And all his friends start begging him for the opportunity uh, uh, to do this. So I did do that story amongst the musical pieces that I did. And uh, President Carter introduced me and I played. It was really, uh, and then that was the end of the night. You know, that was the whole thing was the picnic and uh, and, and then President Carter spoke and then I played. And anyway, so, um, oh, and earlier though, the Washington Redskins did egg races with the kids. Uh, and, uh, and, and the Marine Band had played in the afternoon at, a, at by the front door, south entrance of the White House. Uh, but that was that was sort of background music, if you could consider that background. I know that when I when they took me in that night to play, they took me in the front entrance because I was the, the guest of honor. And and uh, I I mean I was I was sort of I was genuinely moved to walk out there, and the Marine Band is playing, and there's the president of the United States walking around with you know with the kids and everything. It was this amazing moment. And my dressing room was President Roosevelt's map room on the first floor. It was. Thomas Jefferson's writing set was right there. Uh, ben Franklin's Philadelphia High Boy, a piece of furniture, was right there. And uh, after the rehearsals, I had to, you know, I was sweaty and, you know, it was really hot. I mean, Hurricane David was just outside of, Sh of Washington, never came. It didn't get there, but there was that fear all day long that it would hit Washington and force us all inside where there wasn't enough room for everybody. So uh, even though I'm going to put it in the East Room there. So, um, uh, I had to put my stuff on the floor because I didn't want to mess up. I didn't want to put a, a wet Steve Wade T-shirt on a piece of furniture that belonged to Ben Franklin, for God's sake. My mother came in and she said, so you're making a mess in the White House. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was, just, it was the day was surreal. I, I admit that, uh, but uh, certainly memorable. Uh, anyway, the uh, um, I had wanted to play music more than talk about my history, but uh, the, the, the fact is... Uh, 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 I, in Tom Sawyer, I did do some finger picking. On what I did is I had a a, 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 a finger pick on the index finger, and then I would pick, and then I would play because I accompanied the stories with music. So if I was. So sort of an ostinato, sort of an oblig obligato kind of thing that I'd be doing. So the uh, mood things underneath what I was saying to emphasize it. So I'd be doing stuff like that all the time. But because I had the, this, the, the second finger to use, I didn't use three fingers for it. So yes, the answer is yes. I. I So yes, so I was playing two finger, but it wasn't like I was um, in in as disciplined a format as what uh, 
songs that we might learn would be. It was uh, musical accompaniments, but there were fragments of songs throughout all of the stories that I did. There were several hundred identifiable pieces of music underneath the stories in Bantry Dancing. I did a thing for ASCAP uh, of those, and it was, uh, I believe, 350 pieces of music that were, that the, what I did for ASCAP years and years ago was a, a full performance it solo of all of the tunes. And for me, it was a great learning experience because I cast each of the tunes according to the actual keys they were on and the, and, uh, the source recordings had done or the sources had done for me. So it created a great variety. And it was, a, for me, more than for them, it was a great learning tool. I mean, for them, it was for an award, but for me, it was really a great, more rewarding than, than that award ever was. Wow. Well, the reason I, I pushed you in that direction is as you know, one of my missions as as someone in the music world and and as an advocate for the banjo is to dispel the notion that two finger banjo is this hidden little undesirable thing. And and what you've told us in this remarkable story of one of your many career highlights so far is that two finger is at least prominent enough that it, it has been performed at the White House. So I feel like that <laughs> that's a distinguishing. Well R remark for this style of banjo well, playing. Well, Wade Maynard did it during the Roosevelt uh, era uh, too, and he uh, he uh, Wade and uh, played played at the White House, uh, and he did two finger too, and uh, uh, worth remembering. He, I worked on a, a, a book about him. I, I, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's published by University Press of, Min um, of Mississippi. Dick Spotswood. Uh, as the author and I and I wrote the uh, essay on Wade's playing and and uh, and in the book is uh, largely based on scrapbooks that Wade kept and so it's lots of pictures and things and um, are rewarding. What would, what would you say was was a definitive part of his style? Because he he is one of the maybe more prolific and and longest lives uh, finger picking old time banjo players. How how do you describe his style? Well, he had a thumb and a finger pick on and a very uh, deft, uh, clear sense of melody. Uh, he always, he really understood the melodies he wanted to play and how he wanted to approach it. He had, he made a difference. He told me making a distinction between show music and listening music. And for him, that was a, a telling difference. And his uh, preference was the, the listening music. He, so I think what that means really is a very thoughtful way to uh, a conscious way of, of assembling um, melody. Um, uh, another banjo player that was important to me from the very start, I said that there was fretless banjo and the influence of Frank Prophet, and we've talked about Doc Hopkins, who had played a little, his first banjo was a fretless banjo with a cigar box drum, and he said it made a little thud, thud sound. And like I said, we used to do that Sourwood Mountain together. But uh, another banjo player who was on a fretted banjo <clears throat> that was early in my introduction to two finger style was Bascom Lunsford from uh, South Turkey Creek, North Carolina. So he's near Asheville. And Fleming went to visit him too. I, I never met him and I, I wish I did because I could have. But I, I got to his festival, it was too late. It was a year too late. And... Like Wade Maynor, he's leading with his index finger. Asheville Junction, Swano Mountain, that's my home, that's my home. I'm going back to Swano Mountain. That's my home, baby, that's my home. Last December, I remember the wind blow cold, baby, wind blow cold. I saw hammer from my shoulder all day long, baby, all day long.
ain't no hammer in this mountain. I'll ring mine, babe. I'll ring mine. This old hammer ring like silver, shine like gold, babe. Shine like gold. Take this hammer, throw it in a river, rings right on, baby, rings right on. I'm going back to Swato Tunnel, that's my home, babe, that's my home. Oh, I love that song. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, air in it, a lot of places to breathe in it. And I, I, I was sort of making up that high part there as I did it, but um, there's just space there to explore. He would have probably, and his recordings of it, and he did a couple of recordings of it. He... There would be that uh, kind of uh, approach, uh, it seems to me. Um, and that's that's an approach that a lot of Clawhammer students might know from the Round Peak world, um, but it sounds just as good with two finger, uh, especially when it's index lead, where you get that extra sound out of the first string, well, that galloping beats, sound. Yeah, you know, bump a ditty, bump a ditty, bump yep. a ditty, uh, yep. and uh, and 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 they are they do substitute or move within each other. A different kind of two finger approach that I thought of for you today uh, is sort of. Um, in, in, emphasizes a brush uh, more. May I may I try that for you? Oh yes, please. Yeah, um, uh, this isn't how J. P. Nestor, when he recorded this at the Bristol sessions, um, he 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 was using a, a, a different tuning. And I'll explain all this in a moment. Uh, he played with fiddler Norman Edmonds. Your dad might have met Norman Edmonds. So I'm, I'm going to take this tuning here that And I'm going to try to play Train on the Island, the melody that some people play Train on the Island to the tune of June Apple, but there was another melody associated with it that Norman Ed, uh, that uh, J.P. Nestor did with Norman Edmonds. I recorded this on my Dancing in the Parlor record back in 
So that's it, all about tonality. Now, the reason why I'm playing it in that tuning is uh, Fleming had played Train on the Island in that tuning. He had learned the tuning from Uncle Jason Ritchie, who was an older relative of Gene Ritchie, and Fleming and Gene Ritchie were friends. And he had met uh, Uncle Jason, I believe. Of course he did. And Uncle Jason showed him that tuning on Fleming's very first recording from the very first Newport Folk Festival in 1959. He uses that tuning for Hiram Hubbard, a Civil War song that uh, Gene and Doc did at Folk City on that record on Folkways. And that Uncle Jason had done for Fleming. And then Fleming just remembered that tuning and applied it here, which brings me to um, something I uh, worked out in two finger thumb lead style uh, uh, that I'd like to do that from Gene Ritchie. Uh, other banjo players have played this. Uh, uh, I think I know Art Rosenbaum played it, uh, plays it, uh, a song. I, I don't know if he does it in two finger, I don't recall. Um, uh, Guy Carawan, I believe, did it too. Uh, Guy Carawan was um, very important in um, folk revival circles and in the, particularly with relation to the civil rights movement. And, um, and uh, he wrote a wonderful book with his wife called Ain't You Got a Right to the Tree of Life, which is uh, uh, Gullah Tales. And, and they were very much involved uh, both at the Highlander School in Tennessee and, and uh, in South Carolina where uh, there was a, a museum there and on the White Islands right uh, outside of the, um, in near Fort, near where, really not far from Fort Sumter, I guess. Uh, I've been to that island and now I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, okay, so here's what I wanted to play. Uh, finger the thing that I was doing on that up picking thing I, I one could logically argue that I was using three fingers because I was brushing down with my middle finger but you can do that and I've seen it done with the index finger so the brush can be done I, I'm used to doing it the other way for that tune but um, I just wanted to get that idea in 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 the air there the um, Uh, let me, yeah. It's all out on the sea. It's all out on the new railroad, as far as I can see. Swing and turn jubilee, swing and turn jubilee, live and learn jubilee. Hardest work I ever done is working on a farm. Easiest work I ever done, swinging on my true love's arm. Swing and turn, I say. If I had a needle and thread, as fine as I could sew, 
So my true love to my side, down the road I'd go. Swang and turn, I say, swang and turn, jubilee, love and learn, jubilee. If I had no horse to ride, I'd be found a crawling up and down this rocky road, looking for my darling. Swing and turn, I say. Some will come on Saturday night, some will come on Sunday. If you give up half a chance, they'll be back on Monday. Swing and turn, I say. Coffee grows at white oak trees, rivers run with brandy. Sooner boys be courting girls, sooner they get married. Swing and turn, I say. Swing and turn, jubilee, live and learn, jubilee. Swing and turn, jubilee, live and learn, I say. Thank you. That's lovely. <laughs> I want to circle back to something you mentioned early in our conversation because it came up in the first one of these interviews. So as you know, the first person I talked to for the interview portion of this website was Nick Hornbuckle, who comes out yeah. of the bluegrass world but became a two-finger player because of an injury with his, his middle finger. And so Nick, in his performing, is often... He'll he'll play melodies and leads like you and I do, but he often plays a lot of um, accompaniment, a lot of chordal playing too. Uh -huh. And you mentioned those John Walker and Raymond Perry recordings, um, uh -huh. and I just wanted to get your input about what a, what a finger picking old time banjo player can do as a chordal player in those moments when we don't need to be playing a melody. Because I, I I have a feeling you're going to have a unique answer um, to what Nick said or, or to even what I might show my students. Well, that, that uh, Matt, uh, that style of accompaniment without playing the melody was why I play the banjo. Uh, that's what led me to the banjo. I just love that uh, particular uh, music so much, which is what um, Earl Scruggs was doing behind Paul Warren. And for some reason that escapes human understanding on my part I heard it very little I, I was on obviously on the air at some Chicago country station I guess and it was once or twice I, I heard it and that my initial aspirations with the banjo uh, were in bluegrass my first banjo teacher uh, uh, Dan Marcus in Boston uh, uh, played banjo with uh, New England mandolinist uh, Joe Val, and he also played bass with Don Stover. And I, I love what Dan Marcus is doing, and I, I saw this uh, uh, Don Reno back then, and, and um, uh, that's when I met John Hartford in 1971. He was with his touring with his aerial plane band. And... So I loved all that stuff, and I loved Earl Scruggs. And of course, Earl Scruggs was available through the TV because of not only uh, uh, Foggy Mountain Breakdown 1967 in the in a Bonnie and Clyde movie, but also uh, with the uh, com comedic TV shows like Petticoat Junction and and the Beverly Hillbillies. So this one banjo player called a bucket of bees, you know. And
sure I plan to play Kitchen Girl today in three finger style, but that sort of not really playing all melody. It's mostly playing, go, going from that sort of accompaniment thing uh, uh, that you'd find, uh, like I guess it was Leather Bridges or, or or Stony Point that really got me going on that. Uh, finger of that i like it a lot growing growing out of that yeah three finger uh hard as nails kind of thing that you were suggesting with uh raymond perry yeah and, uh and 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 it was gus mead the uh, fiddler and discard uh bibliographer and he gus mead was an amazing person and he uh he put together uh He's the primary person to put together this volume here, Country Music Sources, is an essential thing. And for years and years, he worked on this biblio discography. But when I went to visit him, he told me he wanted me to play that two finger saw just like that. And he was the one who gave me that tape of those two fellers from Kentucky and said, "Learn this." And I still try him, but I I, I love that. And 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 Lee Sexton, uh, who recently passed away. Uh, could certainly, when he worked on those F tunes that he did, those wonderful ranges of songs like this and Shady Grove, he he was in that uh, sphere too, with that real hard as nails, uh, and very melodic and and very and the, the overtones. I remember when his uncle uh, Morgan Sexton played. It, I, I saw him at the National Heritage Awards. It's way in the back of the Listener Auditorium. It seats thousands of people. And it was like another world. It was another time. We had traveled in cultural time to hear him. It was this sound. And he had this Gibson banjo with a resonator. He's playing two fingers, playing this kind of music, this kind of tuning, this kind of style. And it was it was just trans it was really transporting in the best sort of way. Cultural time is different than time on your watch. And uh and that's what he represented. And I'm so grateful for for having the moments to drink in that experience. I really, really am. Well, I I so appreciate every time we talk about music, it, the um, the paths that we go to, go down. I know are often surprises to both of us, and um, your your willingness to do to share this with everyone who's watching is just you're very generous and um, and very versatile. We've we've got a couple more minutes. I, oh, is there oh, anything good. on your well, list that you're particularly excited? If you had to just pick like maybe two more pieces to play on any of the banjos, what what's catching your eye today? This song here comes from um, Lee Monroe Presnell, who was a a ballad singer from the same community as uh, Frank Prophet, and uh, this banjo was made by another member of that community, Clifford Glenn from Sugar Grove. North Carolina, and this is the last banjo Clifford ever made. And um, the, I'd spoken to him over a number of years, and um, the, but the last time I called, he was he was really sick by then. He couldn't come to the phone. He had he was lost the power of speech. But I spent time on the phone with his wife, and it turned out um, Mabel was a a, a Presnell herself and related to Lee Monroe Presnell. And I thought, well, why don't I put this song, uh, 
this a cappella song uh, on this band show, the last band show that Lee, uh, that uh, Clifford Glenn had ever made. And this was for me the first a cappella song I had ever learned. Oh, when I was a little boy, I worked on Market Square. No money in my pocket, I hardly thought it fair. I went out on the highway, I learned to rob and steal. And when I made the big haul, how happy did I feel. Love and I wore the black hat and rode the buggy fine. I courted me a dear little miss, I knew that she was mine. I courted her for beauty, her love to me was great. And when she saw me coming, she'd wrinkle at the gate. Was the other night while sleeping, was then I had a dream. Dreamed I was walking out on the golden plain, whiskey in my bottle and money to go my bail. I woke up broken hearted in the Hawkins County Jail. Was a night while sleeping, was then I had a dream. Dreamed I was a walking out on the golden plain. Whiskey in my bottle and money to go my bail. I woke up broken hearted in a Hawkins County jail. Down come the jailer about eight o'clock. Keys in his hands to sound the guns a lock. Cheer you up, my prisoner, I thought I heard him say. Down round Nashville, it's six long years to stay. Down come a true love, ten dollar in her hand. Saying, my darling boy, I've done the best I can. May God bless you wherever you may be. And the devil take the jewelry for taking you from me. So this is from Doc Hopkins, and this is one of the first songs he taught Fleming Brown. I'll pawn you my watch, I'll pawn you my chain, I'll pawn you my gold wedding ring. If that train run me right, I'll be home by tomorrow night, 500 miles from my home. Dad, with the driver through his head, ain't coming back no more. Tired of moving around like a foot on the ground. Sidetrack this train to your door. That boiler don't bust cause it's eat up with rust I'll make it to your home for a day I'm a walk on down the track, I got tears in my eyes Tired to read a letter from my home Doc taught that to Fleming, 
And uh, Doc learned that really little as a little boy. One of the great Kentucky banjo players uh, who did a, an amazing solo of Coal Creek March was uh, Marion Underwood. And um, he also played in a band called uh, T Taylor's Kentucky Boys. And uh, the fiddler was uh, Jim Booker, an African-American fiddler. And uh, one of the tunes they recorded at the same time that Marion Underwood recorded the Coal Creek March as a solo was, uh, were these uh, trio numbers. and. Uh, <clears throat> One of them, uh, I I, uh, I took a look at uh, at the way Marion Underwood was playing backup banjo, and I've added notes here that that uh, appear on the fiddle, but uh, it just, in points to listening to the piece, you can hear the part of the phrase, the lower part of the phrase is pretty clearly an imitation of Underwood. I can't really hear what he's doing. While the uh, uh, fiddler is playing the high part uh, too well, it, it's it's probably a simpler backup that he's doing as opposed to playing melody along with him. But uh, certainly both approaches are part of this music. And then I sort of went up the neck with it too. When I recorded it, I frailed it also and, and added this other parts to sort of make it a solo out of it. And uh, but I, I I think that I love the architecture. I like the way that the two uh, the way the players interlocked. It seemed almost architectural to me. And I, I sort of thought of that uh, as a sort of a idea of sort of really fixed stones and masonry um, when I uh, sort of built it up. Uh, um, a different kind of uh, sound, but within the old tradition, uh, appeared in early primers for the banjo. Uh, it was a song that Hobart's a tune that Hobart Smith's mother played on the banjo, and I found one of the, and he he played it uh, for Fleming when he stayed with him in 1963. So Frank Prophet comes to Chicago in '62, Hobart comes in the '63, and then that's when Fleming made all those tapes that. Uh, made their way onto that album I, I did of his recordings called In Sacred Trust, the 1963 Fleming Brown tapes of Hobart. So one of the songs that Hobart did, and he had done earlier that year in January at the University of Chicago Folk Festival was uh, this one that his mother had played. He said it's right cute, I think, uh, and it, it's called a Chatham Hill Serenade. Chatham Hill is a community up above um, where the family lived. They were in the Henrytown community above Saltville, and then and Chatham is the next hope is over from there.
again, it's just a beginner's tune, but it's it's quite alluring. What's interesting is these sort of odd length measures that he played, and and I, I I'm not saying I've got it exactly as he did it. I, I in fact I don't, but uh, but that's kind of what's going on in that piece. And there's that piece has multiple names, uh, and uh, come let's march and uh, heel and toe, and just uh, all kinds of names for it that different uh, musicians, black and white, have played. One black banjo player uh, whose uh, two finger style I really love uh, is Lewis Hairston. Uh, my friend uh, Kip Lornell recorded, uh, is known as Big Sweet Hairston, and you'll see from his picture just, just what he was. Uh, uh, that's him right there. And, and he had he had just the greatest approach, I thought. His rhythm, it was like, it was like, uh, Caribbean sounding to me. Uh, uh, Lewis Harrison may have been using a thumb pick and a finger pick. Um, uh, I, either way, it's a very assertive and wonderful right hand. Down, turn your whole cakes brown. Last word I heard him say, file them cabbage down. Wish I had a nickel, I wish I had a dime. Wish I had a pretty little girl, kiss a collar mine. File them cabbage down, bake them whole cakes brown. Only song that I can sing, file them cabbage down. a nickel, some gives a dime. I ain't giving nothing, boys, weren't no girl of mine. Bow cabbage down, bake them old cakes brown. On the song that I come sing, bow them cabbage down. Mama sent me to the spring one day, she told me not to stay. Fell in love with the pretty little girl, stay till Christmas Day. Bow cabbage down, bake them old cakes brown. On the song that I can say, bow them cabbage down. Rockin' up a cinnamon tree, possum on the ground. Raccoon say you darn fool, shake them cinnamons down. Bow cabbage down, bake more cakes brown. Last word I heard them say, bow them cabbage down. there but you know I, I love that that he's in an interesting rhythm there that is Beautiful. different yeah I, I love mean, it compare that rhythm to what we started with same technique but look
they're oh they're the same they're the same tech save your boy is beautiful uh the same technique and yet a whole different uh, idea of the, what the rhythm of approaching the rhythm and that's that's part of the beauty of of what we've got in this uh in this uh two finger style there's just all these varieties and perhaps uh let's see if i can do this the, one of the uh, great banjo players in this uh with a aptly termed rippling style was uh omer forrester uh from McEwen, tennessee uh I, I visited him uh, in 1982, uh, and he just, I, I listened to all the tapes recently, and he just played for hours and hours, and just, I know, I sort of, I disappeared. He just went into his playing, and it was, you know, and he, he we stayed for lunch and dinner. I mean, it just, it just the day kept going because he was that, he and his wife were that open and friendly, and he was just so engaged in playing his music. Was a little bit of flowery girls. It's cool to hear you play that because the previous guest, Nora Brown, um, she played a little lick of it herself. She had just learned it recently before we got um, before we had our interview. And this is kind of one of those like two finger show pieces that, you know, Rick Good plays really well and it makes its way through banjo players. And it's, it's you know, this big kind of 
Olympic sport level uh, two finger arrangement. Yeah, it's it's an orchestral piece, and, it, and I know exactly what you mean, and I agree with you too about that. One piece that I used to do a lot in banjo dancing was uh, from North uh, was Chesley Chancy as uh, Mulberry Gap. He said it was the oldest tune he knew and taught to him as grandfather. And when I visited Chesley, it, he died two weeks later. And um, he said to me, he said, if you ever play it for the people, just say that you learned it from Chesley Chancy. And so I always have. And um, he played it considerably quicker than I do it. Um, he did it on his resonator Gibson banjo with a thumb pick and an index finger pick. I decided to sort of do it as an elegy to him. <laughs> Mulberry Gap. Gap from Chesley Chansey. Um, and the Cumberland Plateau uh, along the Kentucky Tennessee line, uh, a number of two finger, great two finger banjo players uh, hail from there. Uh, among them, uh, uh, Virgil Anderson, whom I just adored and visited several times, and and Clyde Davenport, who I visited a number of times, and there in Clyde, of course, the great fiddler who just recently passed away, a banjo player and ballad singer uh, of of long standing was a man by the name of D. Hicks, and D. and his um, wife Delta uh, lived in in a, a, in Tennessee. And a uh, folklorist, Bobby Fulcher, recorded uh, this song from this tune from from D. Hicks. And Bobby told the most touching story about this performance that he recorded, and I learned it from that. And it's the first tune on the first album I ever made. Uh, is this tune of his called "Lost Gander," and uh, that was published in 1990. And 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 it, D's hands were palsied and. And so Delta held his hand on the head while he picked, and it came out just completely clear, just flawlessly. And so she's holding his hand on the head. It's a bird imitation. Uh, oh, uh, Virgil did one called the Wild Goose Chase, similar. Thank you. 
lost gander. Stephen, thank you so much for being here. Do you think you could do one more tune for us? Yes, of course. I, I didn't even get to Pete Steele. I, uh, Pete Steele was such a wonderful uh, player, a two-finger player with multiple styles of all the banjo stylists in the Library of Congress uh, recordings prior to magnetic tape. In other words, all their disc recordings. I, I put them all together back in the early 80s, making 44 hours of tape, and this, this discography here, which is um, based on earlier master's thesis that uh, the late Bob Clayton had worked on, and my, 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 my worksheet is you know, 57 pages long of tunes on, on all these, they were made on these disc machines, and I listened to it all, and really, uh, uh, the, of the banjo players that the library recorded, he had the most variety of right-hand styles. Uh, I, I love Nathan Frazier's playing of Frazier and Patterson, extremely powerful. He frailed the banjo, but he sometimes would pick notes in between. Uh, maybe if, if Nathan Frazier is uh, one of the most outstanding stylists, Pete Steele is right there too with this dazzling uh, variety of music that he played. Uh, and I, I just want to acknowledge him now. I, I have his banjo. His daughter gave me his banjo, and I'm going to give it to the Smithsonian before I leave this frail mortal club because I believe it belongs right next to Libba Cotton's guitar and Tommy Gerald's fiddle and Wade Ward's banjo. That's where it belongs. Um, but in terms of one more, um, I, uh, well, I, I, I should do, I do, I do. Cold Creek March, but he did it in two fingers. I do it in three. Uh, I don't know if that's the cheating, though, uh, uh, for our purposes. Um. In my book, it's the only banjo song I talk about in my book. Um, uh, it's, it's such... And the reason why is it's such a rich cultural history that he is involved with it. It was for him a memorial tune of miners killed in the Freighterville mine explosion. As one of the persons who survived it all said, it was it was the Job. It was the trials of Job there. There was just just all kinds of I issues with armed militia in the streets uh, sent by the. Uh, uh, governor to outright warfare for two years. Uh, um, then only ended with the government's Gatling gun, and uh, the, and then there were these explosions that occurred. Well, Stephen Wade, it is such an honor to have you with us. You mentioned your book. Folks, you've got to get a copy of this. It's called The Beautiful Music All Around Us, Field Recordings and the American Experience. There's a 13-track CD that comes with it. It's out on University of Illinois Press. And it's just everyone who's ever read it that I've heard has just loved this book. Stephen went through for 17, 18 years, researched this book and prepared this book. And it's beautifully written great stories. And there's, as he mentioned, an entire chapter devoted to this piece and Pete Steele himself and, and 
um, all of the the connected information that you might want to know about um, about the piece itself and those tragedies that Stephen mentioned. So um, the stories go on. They, you know, he connected to other people. I mean, he was Pete Seeger's favorite banjo player. Very different worlds, what they were about, and but you know, they met on common ground there with that. Yeah, I, I was just before we logged on looking at that that page in the chapter about when when Pete and Pete finally met and they ate sausage together. Right. <laughs> and like there's so many little details that you've captured from, you know, the descendants and neighbors and rel you know, various various people who knew the sources um, of, yeah. uh, of of these wonderful field recordings. So I know you could go on for days and you and I have spent, you know, a week together, a weekend together talking about music and um, thanks from all of us for all of your oh, well, thank all you. of your work and your beautiful music and this this extraordinary book as well. Well, th thank you, Matt. It's an honor to be part of your uh, undertaking here. It really is. Thank you. Thanks.